Usually you can expect swords and other weapons from history to be practical in nature. They were designed for use after all. But every now and then you come upon something that looks as if it came straight from a movie or video game or some other fantasy scenario. In fact, some of them, if I looked at them without knowing that they're real, I would call them unrealistic. So let's take a look at a few examples. There's plenty. I just picked five for this to narrow it down. And uh, for this video, I got Audible as a sponsor, which I'm quite happy about since it's a company I like. And I've often listened to audiobooks while going on a bike ride or a hike or doing chores at home. I listened to several history publications from the great courses about the Celts and life in the Middle Ages. For instance, there's plenty to absorb and learn while you're going about doing mundane, boring tasks. There's a lot of useful material for self-improvement too. For example, The Willpower Instinct by Dr. Kelly McGonigal. Of course, it's easier to listen to research about how self-control works and how to improve it than it is to fully enact it in everyday life. Um, working on it though. If you prefer fiction, you can go devour anything and everything written by David Gamel and Brandon Sanderson. You can thank me later. Audible's got several thousands of audiobooks in all kinds of genres, got podcasts, theatrical performances, uh, guided programs, etc. So click the link in the video description to go to Audible where you can sign up for a 30-day free trial. Let's start with something that I don't think many people know, which is the antler mattock. This is a tool which appeared in the Mesolithic period, started around 12,000 years ago in Europe, around roughly the same time that the Neolithic started in the Levant in the Middle East, and it lasted until around 8,000 years ago, with some regional variation. So this seems to have replaced the plow stick, and it could be used either for agriculture or mining, and experimental archaeologists have even demonstrated that an antler axe can be used for chopping trees. Antler is surprisingly hard. I've worked with it before. I've included this even though it's a tool because skeletal evidence shows that it was used as a weapon, like a war pick, basically. There are round holes punched into skulls with these. And if you think about it, this would be very effective for the same reason that a war pick is effective. It concentrates a lot of force on a relatively small area, and it's a weapon that has most of its mass at the top. So you can deliver very powerful strikes with it, you know, just like with a sickle, you know, the one I reviewed, for example, that was extremely effective. Any kind of pick-like object that I've tested so far has been devastating. So I'm not surprised that these punched holds clean into heads. At the same time, this is something you might expect to see in the hands of a lizard man or a tribal barbarian in a fantasy setting. It's a very unique item, simple, but it has a certain raw, savage appeal, if you will. Next up, something remarkably fancy, crystal weapons. These were found in the megalithic tomb Dolmen del Monte del Rio in Spain. This is a 5,000 year old burial site with 25 arrowheads, a few small blades, a blade core that they were struck from, and a dagger. Now, this is made of rock crystal, a type of macrocrystalline quartz. This might have been used as a result of flint shortage in the region, or perhaps it had symbolic value. I mean, we still find these quite impressive to look at nowadays, and I would be highly surprised if people did not consider them to be valuable or at least pretty back in the day. This is significantly more challenging to work with than flint or obsidian. Artifacts made of quartz and rock crystal appeared relatively often in southern Spain five to 6,000 years ago, but then disappeared a millennium later in the early Bronze Age. The most impressive piece here is obviously the crystal dagger. This one is 21.4 centimeters or eight and three quarter inches long, 13 millimeters or half an inch thick and the surface of the blade is polished. The internal structure of the crystal does not allow breaking off a slab through percussion. So this shows that it was probably shaped either through sawing or grinding and polishing. And then the edge was created by pressure flaking. So this is remarkable work. It doesn't look quite like fantasy crystal daggers that you usually see. And I really have to doubt its usability. I think this would probably be quite brittle. I suppose it could be almost like a one-time use 
item. If somebody was stabbed by one of these, the blade would most likely shatter if it hits bone with some force. Uh, but if it's just soft tissue, then it might not, or perhaps small pieces break off, which could be even worse. Difficult to treat, especially at the time, and wouldn't heal very, very easily either. Then we've got a 19th century Spanish saber, apparently used against French cavalry. It's double-edged with a fairly wide fuller, 91 centimeters or 36 inches overall length. And uh, it's speculated that it was supposed to cut the horse's tendons. This is just a crazy design. If I saw this thing, I would, and, and it was a drawing, I would just be like, oh, come on. But it existed. I imagine it would be a little cumbersome to wield, might also have a somewhat awkward balance compared to a lot of other sabers. But as far as cutting horses tendons is concerned, I mean, it, it's a bit sickle-like at the end. Although I doubt you could easily use it as a sickle because it's an asymmetrical handle and it curves in the opposite direction. So, I mean, you could potentially do a false edge cut with it, but I imagine you could also use the straight section of true edge that is almost at a perpendicular angle to the blade. So striking with that might be quite effective. That would have an almost axe-like effect. I'm a little surprised that it even has a point because it does not look like it could be deployed at all. It's at a very strange angle. So I think that would be a little difficult unless it was intended to deliver slashing cuts with the point. But again, you could only really do that effectively with a false edge cut. So I don't know exactly how this was used. It's just speculation. I wasn't able to find a lot of information about it, unfortunately. And uh, it's interesting to see that it has a, a sheath as well. This cannot have been easy to make, yet they went through the trouble of doing it anyway. I don't know if this is a one-of-a-kind piece or if multiple similar ones were found. This is the only one that I could find pictures of. Either way, absolutely crazy design, isn't it? This looks very fantasy indeed. The next one you might have heard of, the Zulfikar. It's a sort of mystical sword, supposedly owned by the Prophet Muhammad and given to his son-in-law, Ali ibn Abu Talib. This was first mentioned around the year 800, but then more commonly showed up in texts about 600 years after Ali's lifetime. There's plenty of speculation about this type of sword. Uh, this is likely one of the actual swords owned by Muhammad. This one does not have a bifurcated or two-pronged tip. And there's a 10th century Fatimid depiction, which is the earliest visual reference that we seem to have. From what I've read, the two-pronged design comes from a misinterpretation of the legends about this sword. Uh, this originally apparently meant double-edged rather than a double-bladed sword. The curator of the Higgins collection pointed out that fractures in the tip of early Arabic wood swords were not uncommon. So a two-bladed or two-pronged design could be inspired by this type of battle damage. This example from the Higgins Museum has a hilt probably from the 17th century, and the blade might be from the 19th century, made in India. The weight is one and a half kilograms, or three pounds and four ounces. So not terribly heavy, even though it looks quite a bit heavier. The hole at the end of the bifurcation here is quite a smart way to prevent the blade from cracking down the split, because this distributes the force more evenly around the hole. Here's a Zulfikar presumably owned by Shah Jahan, the fifth Mughal emperor, who reigned from 1628 to 1658, and also commissioned the Taj Mahal, among other monuments. I wasn't able to confirm that this indeed belonged to Shah Jahan, so I'm just gonna have to go with the statement about it that I found. Here's a particularly strange Indian version with a strongly S-shaped blade. This is such an awkward angle relative to the wrist. I can't imagine this was ever used in combat. In fact, generally, the 17th, 18th, and 19th century designs strike me as not terribly usable. Two points is not better than one. 
in this case. This is much more likely to be stopped and not achieve the same penetration as a single pointed blade simply because things can get stuck in between the two points. Clothing comes to mind in particular. If clothing bunches up or armor, for example, and the, the two prongs go past and then it just fills the gap, this could really create a lot of resistance and prevent the blade from going deeper, let alone being stuck on a rib, for example. So this doesn't give you any practical benefit I can see, but it introduces some drawbacks. So for thrusting, this is probably not great. For cutting, it's still fine, of course. Uh, the serrations uh, seem a little excessive. I, I still have mixed feelings about serrations on blades that were, were not terribly common in history. And I still have a suspicion that they might also get bound up by clothing, but uh, I haven't done tests yet and haven't seen anybody who has. So it's bit speculative. As a side note, here's a double-bladed iron dagger made by the Shona people in Zimbabwe, Central Africa, late 19th, early 20th century. So whether this was intended for use or not, I don't know. I doubt it, but still interesting find. And finally, you've probably seen this distinctive shape in fantasy sword designs. This is an Ikakalaka sword from the Konda and other tribes in Congo, Central Africa. This was not made exclusively as a weapon, but also for other purposes. Uh, apparently, parade swords and other iron objects were used as a form of currency and for dowries. Uh, the weight of this one right here is given by the African Arts Gallery as a mere 380 grams, which is extremely light, I would argue too light, for a weapon. Here's a mid-20th century court sword. So this was a prestige item. There's another court sword. This one has a brass blade. Obviously not very suited for use as a weapon. Iron is fine. Bronze is fine. Brass, not so much. It's too soft. This Konda sword, or should I say sword-like object, obviously falls under that category. It's either a prestige item or, you know, used for trade. There's no way you could fight with this practically at all. This is more of an art object, basically. Uh, same with these two on the right. The left one is the more practical version, but the other two are just pretty out there, so they would not be practical. But this design was also used by Konda slavers as actual weapons, so they weren't entirely just prestige slash art slash currency. They're referred to as executioner swords as well. The curvature under the flare tips could be effective for decapitations, I imagine. If you catch the neck right in the inside of that curvature, it's sort of like a sickle at that point. I've shown and tested a sword which was custom made for me based on a modified design of the Armor Slayer from Fire Emblem. And that thing was extremely effective. That one ended up quite heavy to the point where it had to be a hand and a half sword and better used with two hands. But in terms of just destructive power, the thing was insane. Somebody in a recent live stream asked me about a sword axe hybrid. And at the time I said that I don't consider that very useful because then you're just compromising the function of each. But I wasn't thinking of this one at the time. This is really what I would personally consider a, a pretty good sword axe hybrid or maybe sword war pick hybrid, something like that. It's really more of a pick than an axe. But either way, this does work. I do actually agree with the term armor slayer. There is some merit to it. Now, particularly uh, any kind of armor other than plate, you know, for example, mail or um, gambesons in particular, this rips right through. So it would be quite effective against light and medium armor and obviously devastating against unarmored targets. So yeah, there we are. These are the ones that I picked for now. If you like this, I, I might make more episodes, if you will, in this style. Uh, not terribly often because this takes quite a while to research and make, but uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and have a good one. Every once in a while, you come upon you come upon 
You have to get out of here. Get off my lawn. Get out of my living room. Tool that appeared in the Mesolithic period. Period. The period. And professioner. This is a variety of microcrystalline quartz. Macrocrystalline. Damn it. Micro, macro, what's the difference, right? Big, small, whatever. Tomato, tomato. <laughs>